anything to do with social media is about entertainment. It's not about selling, it's about attention. How do you get attention? Entertain. And so if you come from that perspective, you often end up in the realm of kind of stories. How do you tell those? You're gonna have some kind of story about the company. There's gonna be some kind of story about people within that company. That might be the leadership, it might be the founder, it might be one person company, it might just be them. But hearing their story, that's the level we want on social media. You're listening to The Rising Podcast, the podcast for sharing the stories, the lessons, and all the good stuff from legends in the marine industry. Welcome to another episode of The Rising Podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to have a guest who's known for keeping us all informed and engaged with what's going on across the boating and super yacht sectors. He's a journalist, a reporter, and a voice of the marine industry on a mission to inform, empower, and engage the international industry. He produces videos, interviews, focusing on the supply chain of boat building, and works with some of the largest and most important organizations on the planet in our industry. And I know him from his content all over LinkedIn, and he's got this great consistent messaging on social media. So joining us from the UK today is Ben Taylor. Welcome, Ben. Thank you very much, Steve. I feel like I need a soundtrack. I need a soundtrack to follow that. Like I'm coming out on stage. <laughs> What's your theme song? Like a news opening kind of. Like this. <laughs> 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 you know, right? <laughs> or Rocky, you know, one of the two. Yeah, or like electric yeah. guitar. Going, da, na, na, na. Next time when I see you at the boat show, you better have a boom box playing something like that. Content yeah. opportunity <laughs> right there. I'd love to know more about your journey into the marine industry and how you've become the voice that informs and engages us. It's been quite interesting. At this point, we're about five years in. I kind of did the first job thing, lost about two years there. That was in water sports, water sports distribution, which was really good, actually, because coming from basically just out of education into the commercial world and how the real world works, that was a time where I was learning so, so much. It didn't feel like it. Because there was days where I was like, I was packing boxes on a warehouse floor. And you're like, why would I spend this long in education to be like here with this knife opening boxes? and Just, just staring at all the fun that you could be having. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And to be fair, weekends, great opportunities, lots of fun, like perfect. Product testing. That's what we call it. Yeah. P product testing and market research. And basically, I was looking more into the commercial side and just kind of wanted it a little bit more. I ran a website throughout that time as well. And it was kind of ready for the next thing. So I went to a boat show, which at this point is really funny because I'm constantly at shows. I love boating. I had already had a job in a topic in an area that I loved so I wanted to carry that on and so went to the Southampton boat show here in the UK and it was pretty hardcore I went stand to stand pitching sales jobs like look I'm young I'm keen I'll talk to anybody look put me in sales I'll try my best and so I got like a load of no's and then I was at the globe sailor stand so a big uh, yacht charter company pitching my heart out like let's go they were basically saying no but <laughs> during that time, and they're facing the stand, this guy just taps me on the shoulder, who just overheard me pitching and said, hey, look, we're looking for a sales guy in the UK. We're a yacht charter agency based out of Zurich, Switzerland. How about like head in the UK? Is that something you'd kind of look at? I'm like, yes, that's exactly why I'm here. So long story short, two weeks later, I'm working with them. That was quite interesting as well. It's quite fun because a lot of charter agencies are very, very similar. Like you look at the USPs and what they're doing and it's customized, it's wonderful and they look after you. Yes, all true. So will 300 others, so will 500 others and all that kind of thing. But this particular one was also working on a boat swapping community which was a little bit more on the innovation side and quite exciting. It was kind of why charter a boat for goodness knows how many thousand every week. You've got a boat in your own country that somebody else somewhere on the planet would love to use for a week and they'll have their own in their country. So why don't we just use each other's nice and efficient, share an economy. That would be great. It, it is great. I still love the concept. However, right. it faced quite a little bit of resistance a little bit on the regulation side and insurance and all that kind of thing. But then also you need a kind of critical mass for a community like that. You've got five people in the community. Okay, I mean, you may as well have a WhatsApp group, but basically you've got four other options. 
and they've all got to be happy, got to be on holiday at the same time, all this kind of thing. You get to 500, get to 1,000, eh, hey, right, we got loads of choice, and that's that gets quite exciting. But anyway, I was uh, working on that, and basically over that time, so a massive gap in this whole, the industry does not use technology very well, certainly not social media. And at this point, I'm thinking, ooh, I quite like the idea of starting my own business, being self-employed. So basically, I was looking at a load of different business strategies and things you could do without any capital, which is really funny because you hear loads of stuff all over the internet. Oh, it's dead easy. You could just do this, this, and this, and this. Often, right at the start, oh, you need a bunch of money to even like start, yeah. right? Especially in the industry that, yeah, you started in within the niche. Right. Yeah, within boats and then it being so international and all that kind of thing, like it's barriers to entry were huge. However, in social content, it was a little bit more, well, pretty much with your phone, you've then got content. As long as that's content of value and it's relevant to people, then you'll probably get an audience. So then Ben Taylor Media was born. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it, it's been called a couple of different things <laughs> between then and now because things, things change, things evolve, you improve and, and you're fine. But um, essentially doing the same thing. And it's been quite interesting because five years ago, I pitched stuff uh, like social media management and creating content for people. And it was a hard no. Loads of things have happened between times from just generally that industry and generally the awareness that that kind of above brand value is exposure and sponsorships and all that kind of thing is really, really valuable, especially on social platforms. And then my audience has grown. So it's all kind of coming together now as like a, a really obvious value proposition. I'm often pretty familiar with people, which, um, which obviously helps. Like imagine the pitch and they've already, like, I always think, um, you know, Dragon's Den and Shark Tank and all that kind of thing. Imagine if the investors have already heard of your product or already use it. It's like, I get it. I get it. Done. So, so in the sales pitch and things, it's quite nice. It's wonderful too in this industry to to grow doing something that so many people find value in because your network, as you know, is super important in the marine industry. And what you're doing is basically giving a voice using your platform to so many people and making it achievable for them. So people want to know you. It's a very, very interesting position. And the more you think about it, the more you think, oh, right, okay, there's that opportunity there. Oh, you could do this. Oh, right, you could do that. 100% it self-perpetuates. And then at the stage of career that I'm in, to know and get to know the people that I'm getting to know and be a, a trusted entity amongst those kind of circles is just so powerful. Like no matter where I go, it really works. But then from a customer value point of view, they want to be associated with that. So it's it's like the perfect storm of different things coming together and, and value for everybody. Yeah, everybody wins in media. It's, it's like a half influencer, but half full reporter, like and media presenter and the paying for your reach, but also your expertise and your network. Yeah, I found myself as a company really operationally, like a media production company, and then as a value proposition and to to clients, it's influencer marketing and that kind of pitch. They just want to clearly communicate their product or their service or what they're up to and report on those developments and get it to the right people. But when it comes to the media, it's like, okay, how do I efficiently do that? Because I'm a one-man band. I've started to put a little team together, a couple of contracts here and there that can help me out. But I mean, we're far from a 10, 20, 30 person production team with five editors at any one time just like sorting out all the content but it makes it really efficient and i think you're offering too because i looked at what you offer as well it makes it achievable and attainable to do by yourself i think obviously it's a lot of work and you actually being there to film it is another thing that probably i guess holds you back a little bit as far as how you're going to grow but what you're doing now i think is fantastic and it's a way to give businesses the voice in a different way about their product, right? That comes from an unbiased view of yours. How did you choose the like B2B content route in this industry? I chose it for two reasons. One is that it was very, very difficult to find a USP if it wasn't B2B. So if you look at the boat walkthrough content, which is pretty classic, it explodes on social media. Like a lot of people love this content. Some of them will be boaters, there'll be potential boat buyers. There is value in it. There's no denying that. That's fine. However, for me to actually distinguish myself through content like that would have been incredibly difficult. Like I can't really think of what I would do on a boat 
on a boat walkthrough differently that people would be like, I watch Ben Taylor's boat walkthrough over everybody else's because what's that reason? I, I don't know. I don't know that. And then just in my nature as well, I'm not particularly kind of like, you know, the like classic, really extravagant, extroverted, yeah, wild person on social media. That's it's not me. It's not my nature. And so on the B2B side, however, you don't need that wild extravagance. It doesn't need to be crazy. And in fact, it's better that it's not because it comes across more authentic. It comes across trustworthy and all the things that anybody selling B2B needs that kind of fit my personality and, and what I wanted to do a lot more. And then I suppose the second bit of that is I find it more interesting. Like how this industry works is fascinating. And quite a lot of people know a sector of it, but not necessarily the whole picture. And when you look at a boat, especially something like a super yacht, you look at it and go, oh, wow, who owns it? Isn't that feature cool? Oh, look at their tender. Even that's like super yeah. crazy. Out right? of the world, yeah. Right, wonderful. And I'm there thinking, who ensures that? How does cybersecurity work on board that so that nobody kind of like, you know, hacks and nicks data from it and all that kind of thing? One recently is, how does the waste work? Where do all the bin bags go after a big party? It turns out to be quite interesting. How is it built? Who sells it? What's the process there? How does a broker fit into where a yacht designer fits in? And when does a shipyard get involved? How does that all work? Because it's mental. <laughs> it's absolutely mental. So many pieces to the puzzle and a very interesting way to think about it too. Yeah, so I've, I found that a lot more of a, a pull for me. And then commercially... I'm yet to find somebody who's doing something very, very similar to myself, certainly in, in a similar way. In terms of a commercial opportunity, it's like, well, you got first movers advantage at the very least. And that's over the last certainly three years after kind of putting some hard years in through COVID where, yeah. you know, you need events. <laughs> None of them are happening. No. So after that kind of uh, that push, it's now coming together as like, yeah, there's opportunity there and it all works. And then there's following the people who like love it and work in the industry. They're now learning. I've heard stories of people being like, well, we had a new employee and they came from a different industry. They didn't know anything about boating. And so they said, right, watch Ben Taylor's content, follow it and then look all through it. And you just, you just get an idea, a bigger picture of, okay, that type of business works. That's how this connects together. And this is who they might work with or where the big demand is there or what's the big problem that this company is actually trying to address. I mean, it's got to feel good that you're making the content that informs not just your target clients, right? But you have the reach outside of what your original intention is, right? To spread the word within businesses. So I think that's really cool. You develop this tagline, right? So your content is very uniform. It's very much like these are the facts, but you add personality into it by... I think through the tagline and the consistency, people know what they're getting. So tell us about that and how did you develop it? And then what do you see as the big benefit to doing something like that in your content? So people know roughly that like I do these little videos and they're kind of cool, kind of fun, but there's not like a good understanding or a massive audience where it's really well established, right? That's the stage I'm at. This is emerging out of COVID, right? So there's a load of work that's done through COVID that's like just doing podcasts, working on different projects and just trying to get to know as many people as I can because I know pandemic's going to go away and then bang, that will be my opportunity, right? All that prep's done. And then I get invited to a marine electronics uh, company for their press event, basically. And they fly me out to Alicante and they put on these kind of three or four days, I think it was, of go out on the boats, play with the electronics, see our new product range. Uh, you can interview some of our staff. You could do all this kind of thing. Just to profile the company, talk about it, all right? And so I'm there thinking, right, okay, they're coming to me because I'm a journalist. And so I turn up and it's all very welcoming, very nice and, and wonderful. And about two and a half days in, I'm thinking, right, okay, everyone else is kind of writing articles. And so I'm like, right, okay, surely it's a video, right? What's the video? Do I interview somebody? And so I'm like, right, okay, let's just talk about the company. It was big and, and hot in the press at the time. So I'm like, right, okay, people are wondering what's that, what's going on at this company. And the what's going on hook line was fairly organic. And so I, I filmed this video 
saying, look, this is what's going on at this company and talked for about two, three minutes about it and got it out there on LinkedIn. So did that about 10, 12,000 people watched it, like a really, really good audience. Big reach organically too. Yeah, exactly. And people liked it. It resonated. It got the audience. It communicated the information in the, in the way that you'd want it to be for that whole B2B side. And looking back and I thought, right, what's going on? That's fairly international. Like even if your English is kind of your second language or not that great, what's going on with something? People will get that. It's straight to the point. I'm thinking right in the text and in the post, right, the first line, what's going to really bring somebody in and what's going on with a topic was really, really good. Actually, there was one alteration I made. It was what's going on with a certain company, which was okay if you're talking about a big company that everybody knows. If it's a little company that nobody knows and cares about, then what's going on with something irrelevant or something that I don't know about is what we may as well have put in the text, right? And so we <laughs> you should A B split test that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And basically I changed that just to the topic so that people can know that what's going on with this particular part of the industry. Oh, that's quite interesting. And then they find out about the company and all that kind of thing. So that was the origin of it. And then I've stuck with it. It works. If it works, don't change it. You're spot on and it's become something that at least I know you for, right? And I think a lot of people out there also know you for. So the content and the style that you produce, but also the opener or the one line thing. And I think that's something that's super important to be memorable in as many ways as you can, especially when you're out there making content like that. I guess it's helped you become more known within the industry and what you're doing. Like I think it adds a bit of um, virality to your whole series, right? It makes it synonymous with each other. A lot of businesses in the industry do like to make a lot of content in-house. And I think that's a great way to maintain consistency. And it just makes it easy for people to know what they're going to get from the content. So I guess tip-wise, after doing this and developing this, what do you think that would be great for small businesses to do along those lines? Yeah, so tip one is be authentic. And you hear that quite a lot. What I mean by that is... If you were somebody that you want to sell to, so you're a customer, what do you actually want to hear from this business? You probably don't want to, I don't know, see the morning meeting or anything to do with what somebody had at lunch or a hundred different pictures of the product that you provide, manufacture, sell, whatever. Think of it as entertainment. So what's the most entertaining thing about your business? If you're at a social event, what do people ask about? What's the interesting bit of your company? Because anything to do with social media is about entertainment. It's not about selling. It's about attention. How do you get attention? Entertain. And so if you come from that perspective, you often end up in the realm of kind of stories. And then how do you tell those? And so when you put all those things together, you tend to end up with something like a couple short videos that explain, I don't know, what you're working on, maybe quite a technical thing about your product. Like people like that sometimes. And that approach seems to serve, have certainly served me well, but for pretty much any company, you're going to have some kind of story about the company. There's going to be some kind of story about people within that company. That might be the leadership, it might be the founder, it might be a one-person company, it might just be them. But hearing their story, that's the level we want on social media. And it's so tempting, it's so tempting on social to be like, buy now, or you can do, you can do this now. And you kind of like, you're going to grab for the sale, right? And so you've got to really, really resist that and just be like, no, you're here for entertainment. If you want this product, you're now aware of it. That's all we need. Because when the time's right and you've got the right service, you have the solution to the right problem, it will not be hard to sell to somebody. Yeah. If you don't, different story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if you do, then it's a matter of time. And so as long as you've got that awareness, you can basically just kick back and relax and just make sure when someone does come to you, for your solution, you absolutely smash it out of the park and and do it well. So to focus on the social media content side, entertain in an authentic way. Putting thought behind it, I think, is a big thing that a lot of people sometimes either miss or don't 
put enough emphasis on, right? So you would do a whole lot of pre-production or planning before you actually hit record, right? That's probably a big part of your process in being concise and clear and understanding, but also helping the people that you're interviewing or that you're featuring or the products or the services that you're featuring come across in a way that's going to connect authentically or get the right points across. For me, I know that planning is a huge thing. The more that you do, the better your end result is. So when you work with someone and they contact you, what does your planning process look like? I think the basis of this is if it's good enough, get it out there. Because anything in social media content is pretty much everything is time critical. If you're at an event, if you're on a show, particularly time critical, you might have three days, maybe five days, sometimes sometimes a week to really get that attention. If anyone's realistically going to be like, oh, they're at that show, let's go and see them. And so that kind of, if you've got it, get it out there. That's great. And to loop this round to my workflows, that's quite difficult sometimes. So once you've recorded, you've done the post-production as edited, right? Okay. Hey, Mr. Client, can you approve this so I can get it on social media? Cause I don't want to upset anybody. Like, is that okay? And then they don't reply for a week. You're like, mm. it was hot. It was hot. And now it's mm, a little bit dead. So yeah, definitely get content out there. If it's good enough, bang, get it out there. In terms of the workflow. So if um, somebody comes to me going, right, okay, I want to promote this. I basically have two products. One's a spotlight where it's just myself in the video. So if you want a third party doing that, it's more like an elevator pitch in that case. So it's two minutes of me going, here's the key points. This is what it's about. Bosh, 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 bosh. And then two minute video. Here you go. Right. Nice. The interviews are a little bit more complicated. So a frustration of mine is you meet up with somebody, you got this interview organized, you know your topics and you go, hey, good to see you. Da-da-da, finally. And yeah, we're here at the show. It's fun. And you go, right, okay, what, what are we talking about? Right. So to clarify, we've got these topics and this. And just just a quick question. How does that work? And every time I do it, they explain it perfectly well in a really natural way. And then I ask them again five minutes later on camera. And they go, nah, I'm, I'm trying to say this, <laughs> but I, I mean that. And I, it doesn't flow. It doesn't kind of like go. I now try not to ask so much just before the interview and, and maybe way before the interview and kind of email communications and, and that kind of thing. So we know the topics and I can research the topics. So that's just, that's just me. And then actually in person, I have a rule of the first take is the best take. And I will literally jump up and down in front of them going, right. Okay. You ready? Right. First takes the best take. We're going to go for it. And they're like, okay. And they find some energy They get into it and like, right, let's go. That has definitely served me well. It's from a background in music and my music teacher years and years and years ago when we were recording stuff said, the first take is the best take. You're going to go for it. So that, that's the kind of root of it. But I've definitely found like it's a moment. A moment is entertaining. Like a certain kind of interesting, engaging time. It doesn't have to be that long. It can be five minutes. Perfect for a video. Then they need to be switched on and ready. So that's one way I kind of hype them up. I resonate with that a lot. Two things in particular. One is changing your state. Something that I always do similar jumping around, right? Getting people out of the, oh, I got to do an interview. You know, like it works with everything, whether it's a, a big story piece that I'm doing or you're sitting down with interview or even in between takes. If it's not feeling right, get up, change it up, jump up. You look like an idiot to whoever, but who cares? Like physiologically, it gets the blood flowing, gets you completely different and it works wonders. The other one is pressing record as you sit down before you ask those questions and not telling them that it's recording. That's the hot tip because like you're saying, the first take is the best take. And when the pressure's on, right, then everyone's like, oh, I got to say this perfectly. And, you know, yeah, yeah. that I guess the beauty of editing, too, is you can get some of that from different takes and, and make it all sound great. That's one thing that I've found is just the pressure's off. It's casual conversation first, right? I hate editing. I want to be like chatting to somebody. I want to be traveling. I want to be like working on my business rather than sat there like making sure a caption's correct and i suppose the reason for that is workload yeah as long as you can get that human element to it i think it's an art to do within while you're editing but also if you're just recording it and putting it out there sometimes that 
that works just fine depending on you know what you're doing i think so the, the show season kicks off in september and i'm currently preparing for all, all that kind of stuff by the time of the release of this it'll it'll be kind of like ongoing so maybe it's there now i thought of one thing like you know that hook right at the start to be like this is what the content's about bang in like three five seconds i really want to add to my workflow that i'm going to do the interview and then i'm going to create the hook afterwards because i'll know the best thing that we've talked about and that's going to get people's attention so record the whole thing right and that recording and then do a little clip at the end that is we're going to hear about this and then i know exactly what's going to come up so from an editing perspective it's easier and then also i've got the best possible hook without trying to like kind of speculate it right at the start it's great to do that i think while it's fresh but also being clear and concise is super important i think it goes with everything that you're producing now and maybe a few different options for hooks is always good if you're going to run ads i know you do a lot of organic stuff but different things get different people's attention right yeah. And the hook is super important. No one's going to watch it if they're not interested in those first few seconds. So, well, you're talking about COVID times. You had a lot of time to learn editing. I'm assuming you didn't enjoy your time spent editing during COVID. You wrote a book, which is a bestseller, which is amazing, called Pivot and Grow. So I'd love to know a bit about the book and why you wrote it. And how did that mindset of pivoting serve you during the pandemic? So I loved the concept of the book because I didn't have to write the whole thing, <laughs> but for good reason, like right? Yep. The, the publisher I spoke to is a hilarious guy. And he's like, look, in honesty, most people do not have a good book in them. I'm like, All right, I know what that means. <laughs> I don't. But <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you probably have a good chapter in you. And so condense whatever you were thinking about talking about throughout a whole book into one chapter, you've probably got enough space there and it's just going to be richer, better content. I was like, okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And then when you release it, because I think I want to say there was 12 or 14 different chapters. And so you've got about 14 people that are the co-authors of this book. And so when it comes to promoting it, you've not just got one person's effort, you've got 14, which is quite clever. It's also very clever from the publisher's point of view because you pay to do a chapter because you don't make the money off the royalty of the book or anything like that. That's what the publisher does. But you, you make money from being a published author. And so to be fair, it worked. And so at the time, you're talking about mid-pandemic events are just like crashed and burned you've got the industry actually experienced an uptake in boating a lot of people said hey let's let's get a boat because that would be fun and you don't necessarily need to get on a plane or travel or interact with, <laughs> with too many people and so you have this scenario where the industry is actually up events are down the way the whole industry needs to market to each other and to other industries of the markets new generations is all like kind of new and fresh. There's big opportunity there, but nobody has a clue how to do it. Because <laughs> most people in the industry, certainly the decision makers, they're probably middle-aged white men. But it's certainly not an industry full of diversity and young people and different perspectives. But the result of that was not many people knew what to do at all. And so with the title of Pivot and Grow, it was, okay, what can you do differently now? What's actually taking place? And so I focused on the marine industry for obvious reasons, because it's great, and talked about that in the chapter. So that's that's what the focus was about. Very cool. Did you write it during COVID? or I was kind of late to the party. They gave me a week. <laughs> <laughs> you, wrote a, you wrote a chapter of a book in a week that turned yeah. into a bestseller. If yeah. that's not your other tagline, I don't know what, <laughs> what it yeah. is. No, maybe it's a bit long, but we can work on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was merely COVID. There wasn't much else going on. It was like, look, what the heck? Put some time into it, go for it, prioritize it, and yeah, smashed it. Well, how do you think that has affected your journey, or how did that serve you then being a part of this book? I'm a little bit obsessed with positioning. I think it's where the, the, a lot of the value from what I do comes from, because today there's a difference between a video interview and influencer content with Ben Taylor compared to a random person on the street, even if we ask exactly the same questions, have exactly the same conversation, maybe they have the, a similar nature. 
and, and character. It's still not the same. Why is that different? Well, it's kind of personal reputation and branding and positioning because it's different depending on who says what, which is bizarre to think about when you think, right, okay, if one person says something, it has a different level of impact compared to if somebody else said exactly the same thing. <laughs> like what? But it, it comes down to positioning. It comes to branding and reputation. And so something like being a published author is great for that. And at the time, it was, yeah, a great opportunity to be like, right, okay, let's let's get a book, published author. That's like one step. You've got to do way more steps than I ever thought to make that kind of compound and build to a level where it's really impactful. But it's a great step along that road. And so that's that's why I did it. That's That's the impact of it. That's fantastic. I think like most great things, they're very involved. Nothing comes easy. But I think the fact too that you did published part of this book. When you started, did you have an idea? Because I think this is something that a lot of people maybe don't think about, right? I know the importance of positioning and where you see yourself in the, you know, low cost to super premium side of things. And I think there's many different facets of that within our industry. When you started, did you know what was your, I guess, goal or what's your intention with your position? Did it start from the start or did you kind of get your feet wet and then all of a sudden go, okay, this is actually now where I want to be. I would be lying if I said like, this is where I've been aiming. And over the past five years, I've kind of just like been focused on that. Oof, go straight there. I've got a little bit distracted sometimes. I started a company in um, virtual showrooms. So like 3D experiences and 3D meeting rooms. Like I started getting into that completely distracted and then uh, winded back on this, right? Okay. This opportunity comes up, right? Okay. And here's a story for you. So, Pandemic is kind of starting to cool off. There's a couple industry events that are starting to happen. And so I'm like, right, okay, now's my time. What can I do? What can I sell? I sat down with a partner and <laughs> she's like, look, why do people pay you and when do they pay you? And I'm like, basically when I present, that's when I get paid. Right, okay, great. Present more. <laughs> that was the brief. <laughs> I'm like, right, okay, great. And... She was spot on. Like, I mean, it's, it's so obvious. But at the time, when you're so involved in all this stuff, and you're like, well, yeah, the, the potential of that is absolutely massive. So should I put more resource into that? Well, yeah, but next week, you know, like, we've got to pay rent and we've got to eat. And so... Shiny object syndrome, the squirrel, trying to do all the things. I think it's a common entrepreneur thing, right? You want to just get so, be excited yeah. by everything. You want to solve all the problems. You yeah. go on to the next thing because it gives you that feeling of like doing something great and the potential of, of things. But I think when you do find what you love and what works for you, like I think you have now and I, I have over the last few years, I think it's a completely different thing because you get excited about the little things within what you're doing instead of just the next big thing that's like completely different, right? And you can focus on that and improve like the small things that make the big differences focus is so powerful i've seen a couple companies recently where they've gone right okay our current market isn't great let's diversify a little bit let's open this kind of service and i think they're inspired by especially larger companies who can do that because they can take that risk and they have that buffer and they have a, a huge amount of resource that you just kind of never see. You never understand how much resource it takes to diversify. And it's, it's really risky. I consider it as almost as risky as opening a new company in a completely different venture. The temptation in from my position is, could I go into production videography? There's a lot of competition there and they're a lot better than me and they can't do what I'm doing. So even if there's a little fluctuation, a little bit of difficult, like lack of industry events, what I'm doing is fairly seasonal. I s still come to the conclusion of stick to what I'm doing. If I can do more of them, if I can do it a little bit better, then it's going to pay off way more than the others. But rewinding to kind of emerging from when these events are resuming. So early days, I took quite a lot of risk. I still like a little bit of risk as long as I know what I'm doing. But there was a risk that I took, which was basically the price of these was pretty affordable. As in like a company would take a punt on one of these and just be like, look, he's willing to come and do a video. Let's give him his money. Like, so let's just see yeah. what happens. We what spent that on coffee like, last week. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly, <laughs> exactly. 
And they're like, hold off on the beers tonight and we'll be fine. So a different marine electronics company, but a massive one, was just like, right, we'll take a punt, do it. And so I'm like, right, okay, I've got this tiny little order. I'm going to make a loss for traveling to this show. It's to the Can Yachting Festival. I was like, just get there and do it. You've got proof of concept. You've got a client then and just see what happens. Ended up going to the show with one video, pretty big loss in terms of the economics setting off and then throughout that show i think you've got three or four more which kind of leveled off the economics and a lot more presence and da, 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 da. and so it kind of self-perpetuated and, and went there but um that level of risk i'm much more comfortable with rather than like a, a diversification or something new i'm just like oh just absolutely nail this like it's it's an open field i'm dominating it's great i think it's great it also at least that experience that you had although you know you think it may have been cheap and it probably was but it's the no-brainer offer that's a, a beauty or an art in itself is developing that that it makes sense for you and the fact that you can get more while you're there but super easy to just say yes right i think that also comes from understanding the bigger picture right in your career and in the industry and seeing where you want to go. Understanding that is really important in seeing the situation and what you're doing is bigger than just right in front of you, right? So I'm curious why you think that and how that comes across in what you do in, in your business and life. So one of the things that I hate to do, but I know it's really good for me, is look back at my old content. And there's some really old stuff out there that I'm just like, oh, and so you see that growth and then you kind of shrink that time scale into, well, how was a year ago? Okay, it's a lot better, right? How much have we improved since six months ago? Where is it now? And it's just go, do, do, do. and right, that's progress. Great for my ego. Wonderful. However, the customer's point of view has kind of seen that. Maybe they've been watching for a long time. Maybe they've just recently started watching me, engaging with me, whatever. And you can, you kind of realize the standard of it. And this game as a business model is really good when you've got momentum going. So the big cost for me by absolutely miles are travel. And it's it's pretty devastating. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you've seen the decline of budget travel recently, but uh, they're about 10 times what they were, which is very yeah. unfortunate. But once I'm at an industry event, the cost of doing one more video is ridiculously small. However, doing one video for a whole event is just not very economically efficient. And so... The luxury I find myself in is I can play this pretty long-term game where it is well worth helping out a small company, a new customer. Maybe it's not for the revenue that I would normally charge or really want or what it's worth, but they engage with me. You kind of create this gravity where if you do a job well and provide it to them and they love you for it, just wait. Just wait because... You can be pretty confident next time they want something even remotely similar, then they'll call you and bang, you've got a full-blown customer. And so now that the the company's kind of established and I've got this position, all that kind of thing, I can really play that long-term game where look, there's, there's one or two kind of favors and, and little bits of added value, extra value, little, little lead magnets for people to enjoy and I can do that with the confidence that, you know, they won't all pay off. Some I'll, I'll one I flew to the US for. <laughs> this is for a very big company that I will eventually land as a full-blown client. But they wanted to do like a pilot thing. And I was like, I was not going to the US. That was a transatlantic flight to do a series of like five videos. And I'm like, I don't really have the time. I'm going to lose a good week doing this. It's going to be virtually a net zero for doing it anyway but i'm like yeah but you could draw in the big client and then if you're there you can do a little bit more for this client and this client that, that i already serve they'll be super happy right okay so with a bit of kind of a positive outlook and just going for it it pays back so well i do all sorts from like little videos or certainly if it's like a charitable organization or an organization with a really good like ethical purpose uh, it's usually around mental health or um, some kind of conservation and, and that kind of thing. Then I'll often do it for nothing and just kind of help them out. 
which is, yeah, great social credit, whatever you want to call it. And then things like I run a, a completely free international marine networking event every month. And I'm just like, look, if somebody meets somebody else, they can do business together, they can help each other, whatever. Maybe they say hello, maybe they make someone smile. That's fine. Great. Actually, this started, I don't know, three or four years ago. What's happened over that time is that there are people all around the world that I now know pretty well that I've ended up meeting in person and will be friends with, if nothing else. But certainly as kind of a good contact, a good connection with people, it's created this system where if somebody's looking for roughly my kind of services, there are plenty of people that are very, very happy to go to speak to Ben Taylor. That's all I need. Even commercially, you know, you know, with these things, it sounds great. And then, I don't know, you've got to pitch it to a board of directors and like, yeah, where's the ROI? There is an ROI. It might not be completely measurable and data driven, but yeah, it's a little bit intangible, but it exists, definitely exists. I think that's something super special. It shows when you do things like that, whether it is your like interviews for free or for cheaper, because it shows you care, which is a big thing that. I think a lot of people look for shows your character and they know they feel like they can trust you, which is what it's all about in an industry that's built on relationships. But it's also really great, I think, to do things like that and having your perspective be on that long time horizon. Things like, you know, a podcast and giving people voices or starting a huge marine networking group, like the little things I think that you know you're doing it for the right reason. And yeah, maybe they'll pay back financially or whatever, but you're not always doing it for that way. You're doing it because it feels right. And it feels like a good thing to do. Recently, the Marine Marketers of America put on like the mentorship program, but like even Sounding Straight Only did one. Like, I don't know where in what other industry in the world can you like get paired up for free with the top people in the industry who are willing to give you their time and give you advice or listen to you and give you their expertise, like blows my mind that that happens. And it's free. And it's just because it's, I think a lot of people have that same mindset, which is such a wonderful thing about this industry. And the fact that you're contributing to that and doing something on your own is fantastic. I think it's awesome. Everybody definitely needs to uh, go check out the club. I know I will. Yeah, yeah, do it. I mean, yeah, come on. It's, it's going to be a little bit difficult if you are in Australia. It'll be in the middle yeah. of the night, <laughs> but you're welcome. Is it recorded? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, um, we had a keynote speaker on uh, who's based out of Sydney. It was it, the last event was yesterday, and as in the most recent event was yesterday. And <laughs> this poor bloke's like yawning before before he goes live on the webinar. Oh, I'm man. like, what time is it there? He's like, it's two a.m. Mate, <laughs> like I've woken up for this. I'm like, mm -hmm. well, good effort. You got a big thank you from everybody for, for doing that. I've never been outside the marine industry. Not really. I mean, I think the water sports industry quite independent from the marine industry and the, and the boating side. But I mean, I've only really been in the, in the marine side. And I, I've not seen other industries and what people are like there. I've heard things. I don't really want to leave the industry. <laughs> so uh, I think there's that kind of nice people are about. I think in reality, the reason why it really happens is because it is worth doing. And I mean, worth doing, whether it's that individual that's mentoring you, that might have opportunities in the future, maybe they're moving companies, maybe they're starting companies, buying companies, selling companies, whatever. Knowing people and helping people, it works. If you serve them, they'll serve you. Like Words to live by. You interview a lot of people and you get to meet a lot of people. How have you seen that in successful people that you do get to speak with? Because you have access to a lot of these people that are at top of the industry or top of their company. So I'm, I'm curious how that view, whether it be the bigger picture view or the kindness and caring view comes across in the people that you interview. I would say the vast majority are kind, genuine, wonderful usually have some kind of strong character about them. That's kind of the short conclusion that I've, I've certainly seen, yeah. We'll take the large majority for sure. And I think it's a sentiment to what actually gets you there. Like, if you're horrible in whatever way, people avoid you, everything avoids you. The opposite is true. Be kind, be nice, and things come towards you. It's opportunities, it's people, it's connections, it's fun, it's money, it's the works. 
So if you can create that, then it, it self perpetuates, it comes together for sure. That's very true. I'm curious because you have your finger on the pulse on many things in the industry and all that's happening and going on. What's a significant trend that you see right now in like the marine or super yacht industry? You know, I mentioned people don't look at super yachts and go, where does the rubbish go? I met a bloke that deals with the rubbish. <laughs> he has some mental stories, right? It's a guy called David Gates. He runs a company called Super Yacht Rubbish. And basically he's found these machines. They have special bin bags and it shrinks the rubbish, like it airtight shrinks it. And that way it doesn't stink. It can be stored better, all this kind of thing, right? Wonderful. You think, why does that exist, right? <laughs> so, so someone goes, right, Ben, you would not believe what happens on some of these boats. One boat he went on was storing their rubbish in basically like a, there'll definitely be a technical term for this, but basically a trap door on the bow, right? And so you've got these two, two huge doors on the bow. One's like kind of got the tender arm, you've got the crane to lift it out in the water. The other one, it's full of bin bags, right? And so just under those hatches is the crew sleeping area. Oh, no. Right? Oh, and so rough. towards the end of charters, or they've not been into like a suitable marina recently, then there'd be bin juice coming out of the bottom of these things. You could smell all the odors from them, and the crew have to go and sleep underneath them. Yeah, not great. Also not great for a charter when you have guests out on the bow or anything like, oh. The more you think about it, you're like, right, that's why yeah. I have business. This makes so much sense. And right. to dispose of it, I mean, a common thing to do is the crew get on a, a tender, they load it up with bin bags, they go to shore and get rid of it. And my understanding is how that is disposed of can vary from random bins that are kind of just there to pretty corrupt waste industries on certain places in the world. And they are more common in these really beautiful islands that you would find a super yacht, especially the Caribbean. You know, you see all these wonderful images of the Maldives and all these like beautiful white sandy islands and stuff. Turns out one of the islands is basically just a rubbish dump. It's just a massive heap of waste. You don't see it because people don't like that on social media. Waste management, generally not a topic that comes up. Also, you'd hate to draw the short straw to be on the tender to take that rubbish to shore. Yeah, yeah. So oh. you can imagine this guy's pitch, can't you? Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. uh, you've got the crew who are like, look, these are annoying. They break. They just ruin the boat. They spill on carpets, whatever. And goodness knows what car the carpet is worth on board the boat. And instead, they can be contained. It's easier. It's it's better. Like this guy is just smashing it. The important questions that need to be asked. It's true as well because it's so easy to go. Look how beautiful this super yacht is. Yeah, wonderful. It's got a cool pool on, and look, there's a bar at the top. You can jump off the bow. Wonderful. But how it works is so much more interesting. <laughs> I love that. It's uh, the curiosity always makes, I think, a great interviewer. You always want to know more about like all the things, right? How things work. It's a fantastic element. I get excited about your work, right? Because if you're not excited about it, you're not going to do it for long. There's so much to discover about this industry, I think. Sure. I have some rapid fire questions for you. Okay, bring it on. First thing that comes to your head, all right? Favorite marine event to attend and why? Met's trade because it's where you can nerd out about how the whole industry works in, I think it's now 17, maybe 18 halls worth of different companies. Massive. Most interesting thing you've seen at a boat show? <laughs> Americans buying very overpriced beer. <laughs> yep. Guilty of that, probably. What's the craziest or wildest thing that you've seen at a boat show? There's this company that provides luxury furniture on board Supiars and they provide it sometimes on like a rental basis just for a show. And so it's shipped out to the show and the various yachts just kind of pick them up, put them on board, right? Look how wonderful our lounges. And this guy who runs that company was like, basically, we, we shipped a 20 grand sofa over here and we don't know where it is. <laughs> just gone. Could have been on any of the boats. Could have been just 
lost in the delivery anything. So this guy's going boat to boat of his customers going, oh did you God. pick up this sofa? And they're like, I don't know. And he goes to the next one. Did you pick up this sofa? He's trying to find this like ridiculously expensive sofa. Tracking only gets you so far. Oh. Yeah, and he's an air tag on it, isn't it? Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. That's smart. smart. You'd be doing an interview and just be sitting on the sofa on one of his um one of his yachts. <laughs> yeah, comment that's, section. There that's it is. mine. That's mine. <laughs> <laughs> What's a piece of advice that stuck with you over the years? I've got a sign up here. Mm. That I stare at all day. I don't know if you'll be able to read that. That's reversed. Taking the risk is the biggest risk you can take. Regret from inaction is always more painful than regret from action. That's good. Take the risk, get it done. Most fun you've had on a boat. On what boat was it on? On a charter yacht in the middle of nowhere off Antigua. And it was kind of the, you know, that kind of goal of boating, middle of nowhere, nice and quiet, beautiful weather. One of those moments. That's the spot. What's the most challenging part for you of being a marine industry presenter? I think it's logistics. <laughs> yeah. Like being in all these places. It's very, very easy to forget that you're running a company. And so it's not record, talk a little bit, stop record, go to the next place and do that. There's running a business behind the whole thing. Definitely challenging and not something you probably enjoy as much as... Uh... Going to the boat shows. I kind of love it because I'm a bit nerdy with all the mm. uh, like all the commercial stuff, like scheduling yeah. it. Well, yeah, but give me a PNL list. I'm like, oh, what does that number mean? And go to all the accounts. Stuff. Like, I love it. Well, it's good to find other things. I think you love in your job anyway, right? It's so easy to forget. Like a, a lot of people across the marine industry, but certainly the super yacht sector, some people get lost and forget that what they're doing, people don't do. People don't fly into Monaco and talk on the back of a super yacht about what they're doing for work or have a laugh about the event that happened yesterday in the Yacht Club de Monaco with a glass of champagne in your hand and then just kind of like go home at the end of the week and, you know, carry on their normal family life and get paid for it. Like people don't do that. And so it, some people lose a sense of perspective of like, you'll need to work hard. You'll need to do the right things and really kind of keep your feet on the ground to stay in the industry and keep doing that. Otherwise, people will just be like, right, okay, we're not going to send you there again. <laughs> Get off my yacht. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That's what's other. laughs> well, yeah, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Why are you here right now, Ben? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good advice. Who's the top of your interview list right now in the industry and why? It's the new director of IBEX. Because they're newly appointed, IBEX is the sister show of uh, Met's Trade, so it's the US show for like the boat building suppliers. She's come from a different industry, and they've had a very successful director previously, and it's all new. And I'm thinking, right, okay, where's she going to take the show? What's her plans? What kind of person is she? And I feel like the industry is like ready to hear about that because it's an exciting show, it's set for growth. It's like, ooh, okay, and we've got a new leader. And so to, to understand their personality, their thoughts, and what direction they want to take that, I think that's important to the industry, and I think that'll be, uh, I think that'll be fascinating. Next big thing, I hope you get that one. Last one, what's the most important thing that you need to have on a boat? The right people. I like it. It's very true. It's seriously, I've been on some <laughs> unbelievable boats with the wrong people. And just been like, why am I here? I'd rather just be like in some little dinghy with my best mate in somewhere cold and horrible, trying to fish when the fish aren't biting <laughs> than than the back of this ridiculously nice boat in somewhere somewhere wonderful. And I like I've recently got in, into chartering for holidays and stuff. And we've not had the wrong people on board yet, but even with the right people. <laughs> you've got to you got to make sure you're with the right people or it's just going to be horrible so yeah it is all about that it's your crew right that make or break your experiences and you know when you get a good time out on the water it's like nothing else i think and um you just want more of that so yeah, yeah. And, and i'm never sure if this is just like a ridiculously privileged conversation because anyone on a boat okay they've like they're they're probably not struggling like economically and stuff 
but an extreme of kind of look if it's a bigger better more extravagant boat that goes faster or is whatever it doesn't make as much difference as you might think it's just a little bit harder to escape from the uh, dickheads that are ruining your experience out there. <laughs> that may yeah. be the only difference, I guess, from from an experience on land with a good, bad crew versus out to sea. Yeah, so I've not run an event on a boat yet, but I'm on a committee for British Marine and we organize an awards dinner every year. And I'm just like, can we do it like on a ferry, on a boat? And they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. we've tried that. <laughs> it's great when it works. If it's mm -hmm. awful, you can't escape, <laughs> mm -hmm. and everybody hates it. So you gotta you gotta be careful about that one. So um, I'm sure I'll experience it at some point, but definitely words of wisdom, Ben. It's been a great conversation with you. It's been a pleasure to have you on on the other side of an interview for once, probably in a in a little while. What's something I haven't asked you, or how do you want to leave us? Yeah, I suppose you can follow me on uh, LinkedIn if you search Ben Taylor or Ben Taylor. What's going on? then you'll see me if you're interested about the industry and everything then you can see it there with a bit of luck i'm at various different industry events around the world so uh, we can meet there and with even more luck in 2025 i am actually trying to get to uh, out of australia so um if your audience is a little bit more local to australia then um maybe we'll see you there time it around a boat show Definitely do some great interviews out here. Yeah, I think in Sanctuary Cove. Sanctuary Cove would be great. It's an awesome show. We just it? finished Sydney last week, yeah, and um, Sanctuary Cove a couple months before, so. Yeah, I think it's got to be done. Yeah, well, I'll see you out here then. Thank you so much for yeah sharing your journey and insights and stuff with us today. I think it was great. Everyone out there, I would say follow Ben on LinkedIn and all his social platforms. Definitely look into joining the International Marine Networking event. That sounds awesome. I'll be doing that. And also let us know what you loved about today's conversation. Love to bring you more stories and insights from legends like Ben in the industry. And if you'd love to have someone on the podcast, send them my way. Catch you on the next episode of the Rising Tidecast.